both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells are enclosed in a semi-permeable membrane known as the cell membrane or the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane functions in several important ways. Firstly, it allows ions and molecules to travel into the cell and out of the cell. It creates an internal environment that allows the organelles to function effectively and efficiently. It protects the cell from the outside environment. The cell membrane also creates attachment points for other molecules and other cells. And finally, the cell membrane also functions in cell signaling and cell communication. So the cell membrane is an extremely important type of structure. The question is, what exactly is the structure of our, uh, of our cell membrane? Now, the plasma membrane found in prokaryotes and eukaryotes is a phospholipid bilayer. The bilayer means we have two layers of phospholipids. We have an inner layer and the outer layer. Now, what exactly is a phospholipid? A phospholipid is a molecule that consists of a polar phosphate group attached to a nonpolar fatty acid via a group known as the glycerol group. So we have the nonpolar hydrophobic fatty acids, we have two of them, they can be the same or they can be different. We have our connection, the backbone, the glycerol group, and we have the phosphate group that bears a negative charge on the oxygen, which is delocalized among these two oxygens. So there is an electric dipole moment in the phosphate group, and that's exactly why it's a polar molecule. So sometimes attached to our phosphate, state, we also have an additional polar group known as the choline. The choline basically adds polarity to our phospholipid bilayer. So we have the nonpolar fatty acid, the glycerol that connects the fatty acids to our phosphate, the polar group, and then we have our choline. Now, instead of actually drawing out this entire molecule, we usually use a shortcut method of drawing our phospholipids, and that's this depiction here. So phospholipids can be described by using this pictorial image. We have this head, this spherical region, that describes the phosphate as well as the choline if we have that choline. So this is the polar region of our phospholipid. So so the left side is the polar hydrophilic region, the right side is the nonpolar hydrophobic region. So these two fatty acids that are described by using these tails. So two tails describe the two fatty acids and they're connected via the glycerol to the polar phosphate group. Now, the question is, how exactly do the phospholipids arrange themselves inside the cell membrane to actually give our cell membrane its structure, the bilayer structure? Now, before we discuss the structure, we have to mention the following important point. So, inside the cell, we have a fluid that is known as the cytosol, and most of the cytosol is water. So, that means the cytosol is, in fact, polar. Now, the fluid outside the cell is also usually polar, and that means that the way our phospholipids are going to arrange themselves is in the following manner. The tails will point inward, the heads will point outward. So, we have our outer membrane, so if we imagine this to be the cell membrane, the cell membrane basically spans around the entire cell. Cell. Now we have inside the cell is the cytosol, outside the cell is the extracellular liquid, the fluid, which is also polar. So these heads of the phospholipids are polar, so they're hydrophilic, they will point outward. These heads are polar, they will point inward, and these hydrophobic tails, nonpolar tails, will basically aggregate in the middle. So this section here is known as the intermembrane space, the section between the outside and our inside. We have the outer membrane region as well as the inner membrane region, and the entire structure of our 
our cell membrane is called the phospholipid bilayer. So two layers of phospholipids are arranged in the following manner. So the outer membrane region has the hydrophobic heads pointing towards the surroundings and the hydrophobic tails pointing inwards. The inner membrane, this section here, has the hydrophobic tails pointing away from the polar cytosol and the hydrophilic heads pointing towards that polar cytosol. So this is our arrangement here. Now the next question is, what else do we have inside the cell membrane? So it turns out we not only have phospholipids, we also have proteins and proteins give the cell membrane its functionality as we'll see in just a moment. So embedded into the membrane are two types of proteins. We have integral proteins as well as peripheral proteins. So this is our example of an integral protein and this is our example of a peripheral protein. So what exactly is an integral protein? It's basically a protein that contains hydrophobic regions and hydrophilic regions and the entire protein spans this entire bilayer membrane. So we have the hydrophilic regions of the proteins, this region here and this region here and the rest of the protein found inside is hydrophobic, it's nonpolar, so it interacts with these hydrophobic nonpolar tails, our fatty acids. So integral proteins extend throughout the entire bilayer membrane and their usual function because they extend through the entire membrane is to transport things from the inner portion to the outer portion of our cell. So basically to the outside or vice versa from the outside to our inside. For example, we have different types of proteins that allow ions to pass through and other proteins exist that allow larger molecules such as sugars to basically pass through. Now, what about the peripheral protein? So peripheral proteins bind ionically via electric forces to either the integral proteins themselves or they could bind to our phospholipid bilayer. In this case, we show the peripheral protein binding to our phospholipid bilayer and because these proteins do not actually span the entire bilayer, that means they usually do not act as transport proteins. These proteins do not span the entire membrane and function in adhesion or cell recognition, cell signaling, or cell communication. Now, both types of proteins, integral as well as peripheral, can have sugar or carbohydrate components which protrude outside the cell. Remember, sugars are polar and our cytosol as well as the extracellular fluid is in fact polar. So these sugar components will basically attach themselves to our integral proteins or peripheral proteins and will point directly outward as shown. And the sugar protein combinations are known as glycoproteins. Glycoproteins are important because these sugar components can basically allow some outside type of molecule to bind onto our sugar component of that protein. And we'll talk more about this when we get into biochemistry of cell membranes. Now, the next aspect of the cell membrane that I'd like to discuss is a model known as the fluid mosaic model, which basically describes the way that our molecules found inside the cell membrane interact and move. So the question is, do our phospholipids and proteins remain stationary in place or are they in a constant fluid-like state of motion? So to answer this question, we have to note the following important point. 
the bonds that basically hold the phospholipids together and the proteins together inside our cell membrane are intermolecular bonds. They're weak bonds, weak electric bonds. They're electric in nature. And that means because the bonds holding the phospholipids and proteins together are weak, that means they will not remain stationary in place, but rather they will be found in a constant and sideways motion. So our phospholipids and proteins will be in a constant lateral state of motion. So they will be moving sideways as sh shown in the following diagram. So for example, the, this phospholipid could move here, could move here. The protein could also move into different locations. Now, one important point that I must point out is the following. Our phospholipids cannot, cannot actually jump back and forth. So we only have lateral or sideway motion. We do not have vertical motion because if the vertical motion was to actually take place, that would result in very high electrostatic repulsion. And so because we don't want to have high electrostatic repulsion, we don't want to waste so much energy, our phospholipids will only move back and forth and will not jump vertically as shown. And this type of motion, a constant fluid-like motion of our phospholipid bilayer is known as the fluid mosaic model. Now, the last part that I want to discuss is an important part of our phospholipid bilayer, that is our cholesterol. So cholesterol is another important type of constituent that is found inside our cell membrane. And what cholesterol does, it, it, it basically controls the fluidity of our cell. So how fluid or how rigid our cell is. Now in eukaryotes, our cholesterol basically controls the cell membrane fluidity. In prokaryotes, it's another type of molecule that also looks like cholesterol, but it's called a hoponoid. Both of these types of molecules basically function in the same exact way. So cholesterol is an extremely important component of the cell membrane. The polar hydroxyl groups of our cholesterol basically interact with the hydrophilic polar heads and our the rest of the cholesterol molecule, which is basically a hydrocarbon backbone, the nonpolar region basically extends throughout the entire section of our cell membrane like this integral protein. And so we see that by adding cholesterol into our cell membrane, we basically control the fluidity of our cell membrane. By adding cholesterol, we decrease the fluidity because we basically allow, we pack these hydroph uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic sections closer together. So we can imagine that by placing this wall, we call the cholesterol into our cell membrane, we basically decrease the space between these regions and they aren't able to move as much because of that wall, our cholesterol that is placed inside that cell membrane. So cholesterol decreases the fluidity of the membrane because it forces the phospholipids closer together. And of course, we're assuming a constant temperature. We're assuming the temperature is not changing because the temperature increases the range of motion of our molecule.